access. And it's spoken by the child, by the daughter. And back he comes from the queue at the counter to the table where I'm sitting waiting because he hasn't any cash. The same as last Saturday and in the same McDonald's too. But I say instead, Dad. I haven't called him Daddy for a long time. It was Dad by the time he left. It was Dad for ages before that, even. It just happens at a certain stage, 10, 11, sooner for boys, I suppose, and you don't notice. First, you stop saying Dada. Then you stop saying Daddy. Perhaps there's a point when you don't call him anything at all. I'm sorry, Wagsy, he says. I'll go to the pass machine. And off he rushes, slipping in between all the other separated dads, carrying trays ahead of their children, with his rolled up newspaper jutting out of his pocket, in the long navy coat that he wears when we meet at the weekend, because I hate his anoraks that make him look so poor. I still haven't decided to tell him my news. Can I sit here, says a mother, bossy with Sundays and tea bags, and I explain my dad is sitting here, my mum is sitting here, my dad's gone to get money. You can't reserve seats, she says, it's just not fair. She has hairs on her cheeks like sideburns. She smells of apple flavor, toilet freshener. But I say to her, my dad will be back in a moment. In fact, the pass machine isn't working, and my dad has to traipse across the road with a bus beeping him into the newsagent where he buys, this is true, a fart cushion for me and a copy of sugar to get cash back for our happy meal. I don't want a happy meal, I say to him. What I want is a cheeseburger, a caramel sundae, and a medium diet Sprite. I'll have the happy meal, he says. There's a character from Lord of the Rings in it. I thought you loved Lord of the Rings. We saw it twice. I'm too old for a happy meal, I say. All the people getting happy meals are about two. I'm in sixth class. I have to read an article out of the Irish Times every week. Then I have to do bullets about it on the board. Well, he says, if you're so enormous, you can get the grub. <laughs> he has shaved everywhere except around the psoriasis beside his ear. And he looks nice, really, without the scruffy beard. Also, he has cut the bits of skin that stuck up around the moons of his fingernails. I watch him from the queue as he punches his newspaper out in the middle. And I wonder what he'd say if I tell him. He would be over the moon, actually. He is not like other dads. My mother wishes he was. At least she wishes he had been. Shay Shay, I say to the Chinese man who hands me our lunch, because Shay Shay is the Chinese for thank you, and it must be nice for them to hear their own language. I am not Chinese, he says, I am Korean American, <laughs> but fair play to you. And I take my change from him, all the Euro bits and pieces that come from other countries, Germany and Greece, places I'm going to university in someday. And then I shove and push my way back to the table through the other waiting dads. Some of the other dads look younger than my dad does, because my dad hasn't shaved his head or bought slitty glasses like an Egypt. He is not ashamed to say that he watched the first landing on the moon. Earth calling dad, I say, and I settle down the tray. Listen, he says, studying his paper like it was a treasure map. Do you remember that terrible train crash? No, I say, what terrible train crash? There's a Gandalf figure in the Happy Meal. A child would love it. I take it out and examine it a bit. Somewhere at home I have a model of 
Obelix, the funny fat soul who carries huge boulders on his back, and it almost choked the dog, and my mother had to boil it for ages afterwards in the kettle. But that was long ago. It has faded like Polaroids do. In this terrible train crash, my dad goes on, there were dreadful casualties. People were burned to a cinder. There was one man they thought had been burned to a cinder, but he hadn't been. He survived the crash and slipped away before anybody noticed. Why, I say with my mouth full, the chips from the Happy Meal are pretty good, actually. I am hungrier than I thought I would have been. To start a new life, says my dad, to begin again, to begin all over, to rise up from the ashes. That's not so brilliant, I say. What about his family? He thinks about that for a while, hunched over the newspaper and staring down at the leaky, wrecked ketchup sachet. He probably felt, my father says, that it was the best thing he could do for them. My dad always sounds like a priest when he says something unintelligible. <laughs> so I knock back the Sprite too quickly and it soaks the collar of my sweater. But the lovely icy slush seeps through my train tracks onto my tongue. Would there be a coffin at a funeral, I say, if there was nothing left to go in it? Or would it be just a jewellery box? I don't know, he says. You could bury a photograph or a change of clothes. That's why mum went mad, I say. You say weird things in a priest's voice. My father stares through the window at the other dads in their shirt sleeves smoking outside in the car park. How is she, he says. How is mum? There was a diet on the radio and she lost weight. She lost five kilos. I can't do kilos, he says. I can do stones and things. I can do tons. <laughs> there is less calories in chocolate gold grain digestives than there is in Weight Watchers, I tell him. She was pretty pleased about that. She has gone back to dunking them. Don't you worry about Weight Watchers, he says. I work with women who wear their overcoats when the central heating's on because they won't eat anything. Skin and bones, the lot of them. Skeletons in kindergarten smocks. Their breath is bad from the lack of food. Rockets and broccoli and half a stick of Kit Kat at the water cooler on payday. Sometimes it is pashminas and lemongrass, but today it is smocks and broccoli. The Kit Kat is completely new. I don't want you ending up anorectic, he says. It's anorexic, I tell him. There's an X in it. I looked it up on Wikipedia. It's anorectic, he says. What's Wikipedia? I looked it up in the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> there is a streak of ketchup on the face of the girl on the cover of sugar. He makes it worse for a while by scraping it with a fork. The daub becomes a doodle. He's not just thinking, you see. He is thinking to himself. And how's the boyfriend, he says at last. How's Raymond? Redmond is Redmond, I say. Is he around, says my dad. You know he is, I say. When he is, I sleep with mum. I sleep on your side. He sleeps in my room. Mum won't change my sheets afterwards when I ask her. She says if I don't change them for a dash and she's not going to change them for a human being. <laughs> He's all right, my dad says. He wears corduroy on the elbows of his jacket. Corduroy on the elbows of your jacket is cool. Corduroy is all right, I say. He wants to think that he's a lecturer somewhere, and not just a geography teacher in a school. <laughs> but my dad hides behind the weekend supplement because someone he shared a room with in the alcoholics unit in the hospital on the other side of the junction has taken off a crash helmet at the counter. And suddenly I decide to say it. There and then, out of the blue, 
it wells up. He won't remember you, I say. That was when you had the scruffy beard. Listen, do you know what? I had a period. He comes out from behind the weekend supplement. No, he says. I did. His face smiles and all the lines go out of it, except for the line from the stitches when he passed out in the taxi. Then he walks his fingers slowly across the table until they touch the charm bracelet on my wrist. His nail is still stained from cigarettes, but it will grow out. My little woman has become a big girl, he says. It's really the other way round, I say. His fingers climb up on my hand and hold it. If this was India, he says, we'd have a feast, but it's only bloody Ireland. <laughs> we could go to Lord of the Rings again, I say, and have popcorn. <laughs> we'll do better than that, he says. Much better. We won't have a feast, but we'll have a field trip. We'll go to the Dolman. And we get up and go, just like that. Like we always do. While the man with the crash helmet is hiding his face from us with his gauntlet. And the separated dads are taking the burger bread and breaking it and blessing it and giving the pieces to their children. Access to the dolmen is through a long passageway, a lane between wooden American houses with flat roofs and eucalyptus trees on a ridge that looks down over Dublin. You could stop and pick out the shopping centre and listen to the low, throaty sounds of the motorway but guard dogs growl at you as you go by and wedge their noses between the planks of the partition fences so that you run past them. I'm a bit too old to hold my dad's hand, but I hang on to the button of his coat sleeve. Imagine, he keeps saying, my little woman has become a big girl. It's been a year at least since the last time we visited the Dolmen, but it is still there, as quiet as ever. The shiny capstone long enough to play hopscotch on, and the two big dogged uprights where a family sheltered during the famine, and where we ate a box of after eights in the rain on my first Holy Communion. At the far end of the field, where a metal plaque on a post reads, Office of Public Works. A horse is rubbing its tail end against it. Drool is running from its mouth like a sort of yogurt. <laughs> I was always saying to the priest, we should come here early on Easter morning and read the resurrection stories, says my dad. But the priest thought it would be too cold. Dad, I say, I don't like the horse. Why is he rolling around in the nettles? My dad looks at him. You would think he was a vet examining a specimen. He's a mare, he says finally. He's having a foal. Look at how big he is. Let's go back, I say. Look at her dribbling. We'll go round the other side, dad says. We'll, we'll circle her. But when we reach the dolmen at last, and dad goes into his druid mode, resting his palms on the side of the capstone and then his forehead too, the horse straightens and stands up and looks at us. I do not think she is in search of a sugar lump. Dad, I say, she is walking towards us. There's room in the world for the three of us, he says, not forgetting the foal. He's back, you see, in the days of picnics here and me squatting behind the trees when I had to. The people who raise these stones are still in our bloodstream, he says. You can hear them with a stethoscope. <laughs> then the horse quickens towards us and lowers its head like a bull would. Like a bull, it charges at us. And I let my father's coat sleeve drop and I run away. I am running so fast I cannot hear my feet or my legs or my body, only the wind and the sky. When I stop, I hear the world again. I look back 
Get out of the field, Wagsy, my father shouts. Get out. He's walking backwards between me and the horse, holding his hands up like a soldier surrendering. Then he trips and falls, and the horse rears up over him, whinnying, rolling its eyeballs, goo peeling like white of egg from its gums, and its mad hooves peddling the air. Daddy, I say. Daddy. The horse soars, stops, swerves to the side and canters off. Midges are settling on my skin. My dad comes scrambling to me. His face is as red as if he had been drunk. And we do a sort of three-legged race to the car, the two of us to the fart cushion and the magazine and all the empty takeaway cartons that are the middle of God. My little woman has become a big girl, he says, but his breathing is still in ruins and his hands twitch on the steering wheel. I know that I am much older than he is and that he is already aged. I bleed for him. My big daddy has become a little boy. I walk my fingers slowly over his arm until they touch his watch strap. We better not let your mum find out about this, he says. The next thing you'd know, I'd have to see you with a social worker. The moon has come up on the left-hand side of the car, although the sun is still shining down on Saturday afternoon. I'll tell her we went to Lord of the Rings, I say, for the third time. For the third time, he says. But she'll try to catch us out. She'll ask, which episode did you go to? Was it episode one or episode two or episode three? She'd go and check the bloody CCTV. I rub the hairs on his hand backwards, like a parent should. There is a bit of a hangnail on the moon of his left thumb and a dent on the thumb where the French door slammed at the Holy Communion party. Once upon a time I used to suck his cigarette finger for the taste of it. The garden shed and the summer evening scent of it. If I did that now, of course, they'd come and take him away. So I rubbed the hairs on his hand forwards again. Dada, I say. Dada. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. That Thank you. The elements of your fiction, <laughs> I mean, encapsulated. Um, very kind. Relationships, a sense of dread. Separation, yes. even God, everything yes. is in there. I mean, there's an extraordinary continuity in how you explain life, um, and which is in your poetry, even in your most recent book of poems. Um, and you began as a poet, and I think of you yes. as the young Donald Press poet, nephew of President O'Dalek, um, so celebrated for windfalls. Yeah. Do you see yourself primarily We read as a poet poetry today. together, Tom. Yes. 20 years ago, Tom and I read poetry together in a hall in Seville where Isabella and Fernando had commissioned Christopher Columbus to sail to the New World. That's right. That's rather special. That's, That's 20 years ago. It's, uh, yeah. So you see yourself in the, as a poet still? Yeah. Um, I think so, in that I love... Um, I'm less interested in, in, in plot and the narrative than in language itself. Right. I, um, I suppose if I worked in glass, I'd try to be a stained glass mm. worker. Um, and, uh, so it's, it's all on the surface. It's and all in the words. Is it mainly ideas? I mean, there is great lyricism and music in the language of your poetry, um, as there is a great cadence in your prose, but is it the ideas you're chasing down when you're writing? Is it the ideas? Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure. 
I was raised uh, in the in the Preconciliar Church as a as a Roman Catholic Christian. I remain a Christian, um, and uh, uh, and although I, I would say that um, I am not uh, Jesus Christ, and neither was he. <laughs> <laughs> um, I say that because I think the divinity of the Lord has been completely misunderstood by the tradition, <laughs> which associated with power, imperium, and, um, and um, kryptonite, whereas in fact divinity is bound up with powerlessness and vulnerability. But that's my, uh, I should be saying that from the pulpit. <laughs> which brings you on to my next question. In all your work, in the poetry as well as the prose, there is a dense saturation level of Roman Catholic thinking. The characters are rinsed through, I think, with an anxious intellectual Catholicism. Do you see faith as something that's inescapable? No, I've met, um, I've met some persons who are atheist by, by vocation. Mm. I mean, it's a charism, it's a destiny. It's, 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 a, it's a gift from God. Um, Christianity itself is a a fearless and a, a very uh, scathing indictment of religion. Um, and uh, I, um, I remember when I was a child, you could be baptized into the tradition, according to canon law, if you believed that, um, that God is and that God is a savior. Um, I think everything else is negotiable. Um, but yes, I, I, um, I'm not a, I, I'm a Roman Catholic, I'm a roaming Catholic, uh, I'm a, more, more, more to the point, I'm a Dublin Catholic, which is a particular breed, but um, I wander among the traditions and among the faiths. I find, personally, at this point in my um, sabbatical on planet blue, at this point I find uh, the myths and the metaphors of the Christian dream time, very compelling and very helpful, uh, humanly. Uh, so, Tarve, do you think, therefore, a help to your invented characters? You know, in all in the novel movies at midnight, like they're on their sort of fundraising pilgrimage with the yes. skeleton of the bishop attached to the tandem. That's right. Um, but also referencing back to chaplains, you know, a kind of chaplaincy. Um, yes. There are Daniel, who thinks of giving up his, his, his dialysis, you know, in the end, mm. he, like will check things with his sister and with the priests. Yes. Uh, Bernard, who has a sort of revelation in the bathroom when he sees his aging wife, she goes to confession <laughs> to discuss it with a priest. So a lot of kind of the settlements in terms of human dilemmas are, are settled in a dialogue with the church. Is that yes. how you see it for the characters? If, if by the church you mean the, the dream time, I, I'm not much of a... I'm not, I'm not anti-clerical, but I... Um, I'm a lay, a lay person, and um, the institutional church is, is, uh, is rather a mess, of course. Um, but that's fine, because it's about lost causes. Um, the church is about the, uh, the forgiveness and encouragement and embrace of lost causes and lost individuals and lost uh, categories. So it should itself reflect that, um, that mayhem. And it does. It's a shambles. <laughs> Thank God. But it's, um, but it's, uh, but it's, um, and it's not impregnable. It is fertile. I think. I don't, uh, I don't, I believe in this world very profoundly. And I believe that the things of God are the things of this world. I'm not convinced that I believe in immortal life, which is a Greek concept. Uh, but I do believe profoundly in eternal life, which is a Semitic concept, but they're quite different. And, you mean um, life going on eternally? Yes, but that doesn't concern me in the least. My business is to be here, to be 
to be to be here and to be as fresh as possible and to be as fine out as possible. Um, that's my business, and uh, I think there's no there's no point in um, there's no point in hypothesizing about um, anything else. Yeah. Much as a, much as a sperm, a self-flagellating sperm traveling upwards toward the womb. It probably imagines that this isn't much of a life. But, uh, um, not yet. Not yet, but uh, when the sperm dies into the other, uh, something entirely different begins. Uh, and now the sperm can't imagine itself as Michelangelo Pinarotti or, um, or, uh, or Jane Mansfield. <laughs> um, but that's what happens. So I'm not concerned with the hereafter, or the herein after, as my father used to call it. But I'm very much concerned with um, what my friend John Mariotti used to call the descent to the earth. Um, and I think the odor of sanctity is probably the smell of our own sweat in this baffled, fragile world uh, where the only answer seems to be encouragement and forgiveness. Mm. And in that sense, the only logic seems to be the logos, because um, that's, that's my that's my feeling. Yeah. In your work, in in all of your work, I mean, in but particularly the prose, but also in the poetry, things. I mean, by things, I mean objects seem to matter greatly. Oh, yeah. Brands, gadgets, mm -hmm. from Walkman players to the stylus on a record. Calpol, Care Bears, Kodaks, Scarsdale Diets, Big Macs, Chicken McNuggets, Lancome Beauty Products, Moosley, Quantro, KY Jelly, Bin Liners, Malfunctioning Video Machines, Bovril, Cocktails, Canapes, and Diocam. Just, just mentioning just yes. a few. Uh, yes, I do love I do like, love things. Is it, are these things in themselves, are... Are you, is it really what the characters do with them that matter? Um, it's the, I think it's part of the goodness of the created order, um, which is so, uh, of course, it's, 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 uh, it's flawed and fragile, but it's, um, it's a beautiful ordeal, the business of being here.